our first speaker of the night, who I hope... Ah, brilliant, there we go. Um, first speaker of the evening is Joshua Wong. Um, Joshua Wong is a student activist um, and politician from Hong Kong who previously served as the Secretary General of Pro-Democracy Party Democisto. He first rose to international prominence during the 2014 Hong Kong protests and has played a major role in both the Umbrella Movement and in persuading US politicians to pass the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act during the 2019 protests. Um, he has also been the subject of two documentaries, including the Netflix original, Joshua, Teenager vs. Superpower. Joshua, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, with today's motion, the House belief uh, free speech is that I think I would hope to share some of my insights as the one who engaged in democracy movement in Hong Kong in the previous eight years in Hong Kong since the age of 14. On the first page, I wrote my prison letter three years ago, which turned into a publication called The Unfree Speech. I was alarmed at the environment of the prison cell. The letter was written in a state in which freedom was deprived of and in which censorship was obvious. Although before heading into jail, I shout confidently, you can lock me up, you can chain me, but you can never imprison my ideas. The settlement was did restrict my physical freedom, as well as exercising of the right to expressing myself. I, would, I had to be careful about what can be said and what cannot. That experience led me to my firm conviction that in practicing free speech, we are all responsible for ensuring a habitat in which people making a point critical to yours at liberty is tolerated. Otherwise, we cannot affirm the existence of free speech. Certainly, open and civil society like yours should encompass wide range of opinion from all ends. In contrast, in semi-liberal or authoritarian region like mine, there are other either social or legal consequences when making critical viewpoints about the authorities. For example, since Beijing imposed the national security law this summer, information is increasingly censored in Hong Kong because we lost the freedom of speech. That is clearly something we cannot no longer speak. Now, my book are taken off from the shelf at public library because the government decided to reveal the content and see whether I have violated any national security law. Here, I like to make an interesting remark. Very often, we encounter an expression widely adopted by politicians and diplomats describing the situation in Hong Kong, the steady erosion of freedom. Perhaps the honorable speakers of the opposition would argue similarly in a moment that free speech is under crisis, but it's not that bad. Let's not pronounce it bad. However, I've rather not say in this way, the state of freedom is not measured by degree, but it is instinctively and absolute. It's either function lively or it runs off the rails. As a political activist and one of Beijing most disliked, I believe to make our dis dissenting voice heard is indeed a matter of survival. If our voice is banned, that's absolutely no way we can enjoy freedom in other aspects. However, I also acknowledge the reality of the depth of free speech by how it has also put the life of activists like myself in danger. So, apart from their personal account, I have other arguments. Secondly, in non-democratic regions, authorities have legally murdered freedom of speech with draconian ordinance, where whereas in democracies, despite in a more discreet manner. Increasing commercial and governmental surveillance have suffocated freedom of ideas, so as our freedom of speech. And thirdly, from my activism experience, I've argued that only by acknowledging the depth of free speech, we stick our nose to reality. So can attempt to reclaim genuine free speech be possible? In this debate, I do not intend to dive into the scope of critical speech in the argument I made. At a disclaimer, the youth of offensive hate speech being read racially, religiously, 
culturally or gender. It's not what I mean by exercising free speech critically. I also appeal to professor whose identified politics study shed light on pandemic era conflicts. They would further address by why free speech is dead. As I've said the opening, there's a terrible price to pay in making critical viewpoints over the communist regime and the Hong Kong government. Much as I want to enjoy free speech confidently as you do, we are apparently not in the equal footing as I'm not able to exercise that freedom. I speak at the expense of my liberty for the more I speak up, the more dangerous situation I may result in, such as being extradited to China for detention and unfair trial. It would not be surprising if the video of tonight's debate would later become proof of crime at the Chinese courtroom. That freedom of expression is not just vanishing, but not existent to many people in Hong Kong as the authorities request totally confirmly, regardless of the contentious nature of the matter in question. Most recently in Hong Kong, a primary school teacher was fired ridiculously because what he taught at class was not tolerated by the government. To it most situation, it was a class about free speech. Worksheet explaining the importance of preserving freedom of expression in an open society had ironically become the evidence to disqualify the teacher. For the second argument, having said that free speech is killed not merely in autocratic region, in which little respect was given to the human rights and liberal values. Even in democracy, with more sophisticated practice of surveillance and massive misinformation and self-censorship, the existence of genuine speeches free speech is no longer viable. Both commercial and government surveillance control over the content we read in the virtual world. Almost everything is being calculated and the things we see strictly under control. Social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and etc. are part of this surveillance mechanism on a global scale. One of the penetrating lessons that Brexit campaign and the US presidential campaign four years ago, we learned is that our data are transformed into more strategic and profitable information by a simple click on any Facebook or Twitter post. It could then turn around and feed our profile with more targeted content, sometimes far from accurate to facts, gradually changing our behavior and direction when forming an opinion. It is the invisible control of thoughts and opinion that caused the deadly attack on freedom of speech. We cannot reasonably argue that under such circumstances, even in the Western world, free world, or etc., our opinion are given freely without censorship from institution or our own. So to sum up, may I conclude by citing the latest loss of free speech in Southeast Asia. Approximately 24 hours ago, the Thai authorities announced an emergency ordinance to ban mass gathering and impose media restriction, following by sweeping arrest of student activists. Once their voices are silenced, we simply cannot pretend that freedom exists. Indeed, it's become pervasive for us to continue speaking out of them until the day freedom there is restored and reclaimed. But before that, we must admit that in this longer dark night, walking through the graveyard of the trampled freedom of expression is terrifying. So as the people in Thailand, having considered the dangerous consequence of carrying on the demonstration with which the government declared illegal, they decide to fight for the resurrection of liberate ideas, speech and assembly that they can no longer enjoy under emergency ordinance. We shall admit the inconvenient truth that the free speech is that before planting up our courage to reclaim it, in respect of the cause, the pain and tears are had us. And that's my speech of why the free, the free speech is that, and in this uphill battle, how we could encourage the global solidarity to continue the fight and to reclaim the original universal value that belongs to us. I think that's the challenge that we wish to overcome. Thank you.
I don't know if you can hear us, um, but Joshua, if you are listening, thank you, and especially for joining us at three o'clock in the morning. Um, so much appreciated. Um, but moving on to our first speaker in opposition, uh, we have Isabel Burns. Isabel is a first-year student reading English at Robinson College. Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you. 